Hey everybody, this is Mr. Moppin coming at you with another AP Gov video and today we are taking a look at topic 3.6 focusing in on you know balancing individual rights. Uh, previously we have already talked about the Fourth Amendment uh, and in this video we're going to be taking a look at the Eighth Amendment. Now the Eighth Amendment is associated with protection from cruel and unusual punishment. Now there's some additional language in there that talks about you know, protection from excessive, you know, bail and stuff like that. But generally when we talk about the Eighth Amendment, we're looking at the cruel and unusual punishment uh, component of that language. And, you know, cruel and unusual, as you can imagine, those are two, you know, words that are certainly open for interpretation. You know, what is cruel? How do you define unusual? Uh, you know, if you look through history, world history, there have been many, many different ways of... Uh, you know, providing justice through punishment. Uh, you know, be it uh, everything ranging from uh, a probation period uh, all the way to, you know, some type of, you know, crucifixion going back to ancient Roman times. And so the question of what is a fair punishment? What is a reasonable punishment? A punishment that is, you know, protected from a sense of arbitrariness which is, you know, a lot of why we have various, uh, you know, liberties enumerated in the Constitution and in the Bill of Rights out of this, you know, general sense that the British would, you know, just kind of create punishments and sentencing kind of on a whim as opposed to a sense of fairness. And that sense of fairness is tied into the broader concept of due process. But, you know, the general gist of it being is that, you know, is it fair, for example, to you know, fine somebody $10,000 for jaywalking? Is it, you know, fair to cut off someone's hand for being convicted for theft? Uh, and so the Eighth Amendment is an attempt to basically put the appropriate consequence for the appropriate crime. Uh, now, notes, you know, there's, you know, different things you can look at with regards to you know, punishment that might not be fair, that, you know, might not be reasonable. But the vast majority of these cases focusing in on the Eighth Amendment specifically focuses in on the death penalty. Uh, the death penalty is something that is a concept that is, you know, very divisive in this country. About half of Americans support the use of the death penalty as a possible type of punishment for certain types of crimes. And about half of Americans don't believe that it is a uh, protected form of punishment that the government can use, that the death penalty in and of itself is, uh, you know, is immoral. Um, and, you know, basically the, the, the general philosophies behind this is that when we talk about crimes such as uh, premeditated murder, we would call first-degree murder, the idea that you have pre-planned uh, killing someone and then you carried out that murder, uh, for many Americans, the idea that someone has taken the time and to plan and carry out a murder, the only justifiable consequence for that is executing that person, ending that person's life out of a sense of fairness, justice, out of a sense that, you know, though that kind of a person is so dangerous to society that the only way to protect, ultimately protect society, is by removing that person from society by ending their life. Uh, others, though, that are opposed to the death penalty, they look at it from partly a moral reason for some folks. You know, the idea being is that if you are ending somebody's life, if you're executing someone, it's pre-planned and you're ending that life, how is that any morally different than somebody that is convicted of a first-degree murder offense. In other words, many would look at the death penalty as state-sanctioned murder. Uh, others look at the death penalty as a violation of the Eighth Amendment out of a sense that uh, even though we, we try to have the best uh, judicial system that we can, it is not perfect that you know the judicial system does make mistakes because humans are not perfect. And so the question being is, what ha what do you do if somebody is wrongly convicted of premeditated murder and is then executed, uh, and then you find that that person was really not the person that committed the crime, what do you do at that point? You can't bring somebody back, uh, back to life after that point. So some would argue that you can't have the death penalty, 
because mistakes do happen, we do see convictions get overturned regularly. And, you know, by having someone stay alive, that way you can at least provide the opportunity for justice to be served if it needs to be served uh, in that manner. Now, uh, when we do talk about the death penalty, uh, you know, the way that it has been used in American history has ranged from, you know, everything from, uh, you know, firing squads to hangings to uh, gas chambers, electric chair. But what we look at it today is the use of lethal injection, uh, the idea of placing uh, the, the convicted individual on a gurney, you strap them down, you provide them with a uh, chemical, co uh, you know, chemical cocktail, if you will, that will knock the person unconscious, uh, dumb their nerves, and then ultimately, uh, you know, poisons them. Uh, but, you know, still this idea of death, no matter, you know, whether what form it comes in, is still a matter of, at the end of the day, is taking a life a form of justice or is it a violation of the Eighth Amendment? And we see the court weigh in on this in two cases uh, pretty close to one another in the 1970s. The first case of Furman versus Georgia uh, was looking at how the death penalty was being applied in the United States, specifically in the state of Georgia. And in this case, the Supreme Court ruled that the death penalty was being applied in such an arbitrary way, especially with regards to race, that if you were an African American, you are far more likely to be sentenced to death as opposed to a white person convicted of the same crime, but the Supreme Court found that the use of the death penalty as it was being used in that way across America was a violation of the Eighth Amendment. So there was a time in the 1970s when the death penalty was banned uh, in the United States. And there were a lot of folks that were sentenced to die that ended up getting their convictions commuted to life, set, to life sentences. Now, a few years later, Georgia will change the laws that they have in that state regarding what they would be using for a death penalty uh, punishment and creating a system that was much more regulated in terms of taking away, any, taking away any arbitrariness in terms of how it would be applied. And so the court was forced again to take a look at, you know, can you have a way that is using the death penalty that is not violating uh, you know, this idea of, you know, protection from discrimination. And in the, the case of Greg v. Georgia, the court said that, yeah, that the death penalty unto itself is not a violation of the Eighth Amendment as long as it is being applied in a fair, non-discriminatory way. Uh, now, they have since, you know, made some additional rulings that would bar the use of the death penalty in certain situations. You know, for example, Anybody that is a minor, someone that is under the age of 18, convicted for a murder, even premeditated murder, cannot be sentenced to death. That's a violation of the Eighth Amendment. Anybody that is deemed mentally handicapped, uh, in other words, they are not fully cognizant of what their actions were uh, that led to a premeditated murder conviction, the Eighth Amendment stipulates that you can't apply the death penalty in that case. And then also, states cannot have mandatory death sentences for crime. So in other words, a death penalty uh, punishment can only be applied in context to the, spe uh, you know, the specifics of a given situation. You cannot have a blanket death penalty sentence for premeditated murder. Now, beyond the death penalty, there are other questions about whether or not the Eighth Amendment is applicable to those that are non-citizens. Uh, following the 9-11 attacks, the United States uh, will begin to use a portion of the Guantanamo Bay Marine Base in Cuba as a detention camp for those that were suspects of being engaged in terrorist activities against the United States. So basically what would happen is that you would have, you know, CIA and U.S. military personnel that might apprehend somebody in the Middle East, say, you know, Afghanistan or something, and believe that they are a terrorist and, more importantly, in this situation, would have information that would be helpful to prevent any other types of terrorist attacks against the United States. So you would have these individuals brought over to Guantanamo Bay and held 
in a place that would be nicknamed Camp X-Ray. And at Camp X-Ray, the U.S. Uh, Defense Department, the U.S. military, would use what was considered to be enhanced techniques for gaining uh, intelligence, all right? Uh, and part of the enhanced techniques for gathering intelligence would be the use of a uh, of a process known as waterboarding. Now, if you are not familiar with waterboarding, I'll show you this image right here. Uh, it might be a little hard to look at, but uh, waterboarding is the idea of basically simulating drowning with a suspect that you are interrogating uh, to try to elicit information. The idea being is that you as the prisoner truly feel like you are drowning, meaning that you feel like you're dying, from drowning, and you would then be compelled to provide information to, uh, you know, in this case, the U.S. military. Uh, the question, though, is, is this torture? Uh, you know, you know, internationally, it's generally considered to be a form of torture, and torture, by U.S. definition, is something that is not a valid interrogation uh, technique for the U.S. military. Bottom line, if something is deemed as torture legally, our military cannot do it. It's seen as a violation of the Eighth Amendment. However, the controversy in this case was how the Bush administration would redefine through the Justice Department what the definition of torture would be so that it allowed for waterboarding to not be deemed as torture, therefore would be allowed to be used by the U.S. military. And then that then raises the question of, well, can something that's being applied to non-citizens be something that could be a violation of the Eighth Amendment? So basically the question is this. If you are a foreign prisoner of the United States, if you are on U.S. soil, which technically, you know, Camp X-Ray, Guantanamo Bay, that is U.S. soil, does the protections of the, do the protections of the Constitution apply to you as a captive uh, in this case. Um, and so that's one of these very interesting debates in terms of, you know, does this apply? Uh, at the end of the day, uh, when the Obama administration comes into power in 2009, the Obama administration would change the policies once again to redefine waterboarding, waterboarding as torture. So it's, it's not in use today. Uh, but it does, you know, it is an example of a question that is really interesting in terms of, you know, do or should the Bill of Rights apply to foreigners? Should it apply to those that are held in captivity uh, as those that are uh, being held as possible uh, terrorists? And in particular, does the Eighth Amendment specifically apply to protect those individuals? So anyhow, Eighth Amendment, uh, pretty interesting stuff, protection from cruel and unusual punishments. We'll see you next time. Bye-bye.